Okay. I'm uh, here to introduce our presenters. Uh, uh, thank you for attending today's Technology and Education Summit. Uh, if you'd like more information on the topic presented today, please contact the model, uh, model schools or the Digital Media Service Program at your local BOCES. It's now my pleasure to introduce Edward Maloney and Mike Panko. Thank you very much. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'm Ed Maloney, and I'm sorry, uh, I'm the engineering instructor at the Academy of Applied Technology. The Academy of Applied Technology was formerly known as Eastern Suffolk OCs. Uh, they put together an advisory committee, and they said Eastern Suffolk OCs is really known as special ed first, and then vocational second, and then it just so happened enrollment's been dropping in both the programs. So they said, how can we turn this around? And they started a new program called the STEM High School, uh, which I teach the engineering portion of it. Um, I'm a career changer. I used to be a project manager at Intel. Uh, and I, I, I'm not a subject matter expert. I view myself as a facilitator. My students are the subject matter experts. When it comes to programming, they can take the ball and, and run with it. Uh, so again, I'm not a renowned expert. But this is what I do in my classroom. I'll give you a little bit of overview about the curriculum, and then we'll talk about robots. How do we get convex over to a 3D printed prosthetic hand? I'm Michael Panico. I am a student at the STEM High School. I will actually be the first graduating class from the STEM High School. Uh, I run the VEX robotics team that we first started last year uh, at the STEM High School mentored by Mr. Maloney. Uh, you can call me the subject matter expert when it comes to the VEX and programming certain things within the classroom. I, like most students who are at the STEM high school right now, plan to go on to college, plan to continue with my engineering uh, career, and I, and I hope that takes me very far in life with the engineering background that I've gained. So Mike had mentioned he's the part of the first graduating class. It's a two-year program right now. Uh, we got a grant from Senator Laval that enabled the program. It started last year. And we had a small enrollment, and it's, it's grown quite a bit over the past year. So because of Senator Laval and his vision with STEM, that's why we're here today. So uh, My goal is really unleashing the students' creativity. Uh, I expose them to all different technologies and different engineering processes, and then they come up with wild ideas, and you'll see some of them. So please, I see some familiar faces out there. Interactive, stop, ask questions. I see a lot of new faces, which is great, so we can spread the word about what we're doing. Uh, so just briefly, the history of uh, STEM. Started off a shop, then industrial arts when I went to school, then it became tech ed, then MST, then STEM, now heading off to STEAM. So we're part of the STEM thing, and what you'll see, everything we do is project-based learning. All right? It's all about the engineering design process, the steps of the project. And I have a poster on my wall hanging Confucius, uh, uh, Confucius and how we engage in projects. Tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I understand, and that's what we're doing in engineering with getting the students involved and so you really you see the light bulb go off in the head it really clicks and they, they grasp they understand what they're doing a common example is a ruler they learn how to use a ruler year after year after year they never actually use a ruler we have to measure stuff and that's oh now i understand how to use a ruler so uh dancing robots anyone ever see them on the news the little dancing I, every every fall i see them on news 12 i think middle country has some of them there's one right out there. Why do they have the dancing robots? They're trying to get students interested in programming earlier and earlier. Right? And we're going to show you how it, how it uh, relates to engineering. So, yeah. Billion Dollar Career. Found this article. I thought it was very interesting. Right here. Engineering is the most popular degree among the top 100 billionaires in the world. Now, doesn't mean they went on to become engineers, 
but they took engineering in college. And I think it's somewhere around, if I read the article again, 22% of all the billionaires in the world took engineering. So, uh, and what they learned, problem solving, how to, how to deal with things, communication. So it was a very interesting article. Very, very, I'm only going to play a minute or so. Uh, if you notice here, and this is no insult to math or uh, science teachers, but when you say STEM, what do you usually think of? More science and more math. And they always forget about the T and E in the middle. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Are schools teaching 50-year-old science? Some say the E in education should stand for engineering. Tonight, we get schooled about initiatives to provide 21st century learning for our children. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. Tonight on What Matters, we tackle a subject that, quite frankly, isn't at the top of the news headlines, but has tremendous implications for our future. It's a nagging concern that our science and technology <laughs> education just isn't measuring up and is missing at least one key component. And when most of us were in school, we took math and science, but is that enough for a 21st century world? Well, there's a growing sense that it isn't. And one of the educational strategies that's been developed to address the deficits is called STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Education. We'll consider the issue tonight with Jim Batterson, who's a former NASA engineer, who was the senior advisor to the Commonwealth for STEM initiatives under the Kane administration. Also with us is Rick Lally, who is the chair emeritus of the Hampton Roads Technology Council. Welcome and thanks to both of you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you sir. Boy, this is, it, it, it's such, it's a little bit uh, complex and so critically important. So we'll take this half hour to try to really uh, walk people through it. Uh, Jim Batterson, I think a lot of us are familiar with the, the sort of the bookends of that STEM word. We, 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 we know about science and we know about math and there's certainly issues there. But you say we're really missing out on the two words in the middle. Yes, Kathy. So it goes on to talk about STEM is basically applying what you learn in science and what you learn into hands-on activities, and, and that's what we do. And then, so why STEM? Uh, I left an article outside on the table. I have a whole bunch of other articles. Uh, there's a no shortage of uh, STEM qualified talent out there. And I was at a school giving a presentation similar to this, and in the guidance department there was even a magazine, STEM Jobs. You know, so. It's extremely popular, there's a skill gap, so that's why we decided to move forward with the STEM. I see TV commercials all the time. Uh, there's articles, STEM is the fastest growing growth area out there for jobs. Uh, I think it's the next slide right here. There are 2.5 jobs every four year graduate, so if your son, your daughter, your student wants a job, STEM is definitely one of the ways to go. That's the magazine. So I focus in on engineering. What is engineering? It's the problem solving using math and science. So let's skip over this. And there's all different levels of engineering. It is more mathematical and more technical. So it depends where your student falls in what range. There's all these different, and under each one of these jobs is different subsets of engineers. There's 18 different engineering disciplines. So my goal is to expose them to a bunch of them. We don't become experts, and it's really pre-engineering and then they decide what direction they want to go off to a college. Uh, we use Project Lead the Way curriculum. There's a bunch of STEM curriculum out there. I'll just give you a quick overview of why we chose Project Lead the Way. It's the leading provider of STEM curriculum in the country. Uh, we started this program two years ago. Two years ago I went to <laughs> training. Uh, there was 5,000 certified schools. Uh, last year there was 6,500. It's, it's growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, basically, it's college-level uh, <coughs> curriculum being taught in the high school. What that enables the students to get is college credits. Uh, we have articulations with RIT, and we're working with one with Stony Brook right now. And it, we're unique because there's about five other schools on Long Island that offer Project Lead the Way. I have it blocked down, so we have students <coughs> for half a day, so I have two and a half hours. So you'll see in a second. Uh, it's based on different modules. We offer six modules over the course of a, uh, two years. 
Uh, most schools offer one module a year because they only have the students for 45 minutes. So these are the different modules. You see the robotics is in the principles of engineering. You may have in your school world of technology. Yes, sir. Uh, you guys don't have DDP before? Uh, well, whoops. Uh, IED, Introduction to Engineering Design, is really DDP. Okay. It's the same idea. Uh, <coughs> back to state requirements uh, for art credits, things like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Was there another question? So these are the different modules that we teach. Uh, we don't teach all of them. We teach six of them. So they start off, this is a core, this is a core, and this last one is a capstone engagement. Each one of these modules are eligible to earn three college credits at RIT. So they can walk out of uh, my program with 15 college credits. Actually, we just found out up to 18 now. So uh, gets them a great jump on like each three college credits is about $4,000. So. Uh, and what the benefits to the students from the curriculum, uh, they, our studies show they have higher attendance rates, uh, higher graduate graduation rates, they get preferred college admission, um, and you know, bottom, show me the money, you know, they get uh, scholarships, internships, all that, because they uh, participate in this curriculum. So, uh, just basically the students, the, my program is at the academy, formerly known as Eastern Southern OCs. Uh, they have to leave their school for either half a day, we have the full day option where they can take some of their core curriculum there as well. Uh, different type of student, they got to be really dedicated to doing this. Uh, again, we're trying to develop their critical sk thinking skills, getting them motivated and engaged, so and it's really easy to do with the curriculum, preparing them for the future. Uh, I saw again this morning on the news, uh, I was in New Jersey, they said 50% of the students in New Jersey, uh, college remediation, either they fail out of school or they have to take the same course over and they don't get credit for it. And that's pretty much a, a U.S. standard, too. It was on News 12 this morning. So uh, we're actually getting them a jump start on college. And most of the jobs they had, I think I saw a study, 60% of the jobs they have don't even exist yet that they'll be having in the near future. And there's all sorts of statistics. By the time they get to the fourth year of college, the first two years will be outdated already because things are changing so fast. And these are just some of the uh, uh, partnerships <coughs> they have with some of the schools. So, I mentioned we use the Project Lead the Way curriculum. Uh, engineering by Design is another curriculum available. IntelliTech, Allegheny, people create their own curriculum. A whole bunch of different STEM curriculum available out there. So, anyone use any different STEM curriculums yet? I know EBD. You do EBD? I know Hop has looked at it, right? EBD? Yeah, we did. You didn't go with it? Yeah. Yeah, so, a bunch of different ways. This is just a process they use in the class. It's all about the engineering, defining a problem, and then coming to a final solution. They follow the steps. They document all the steps in the engineering notebook. So it's a very formal process that they go through. And this is just some students in the lab working on some projects. So for motivating the students, and it actually ties back to something we did here, we participated in a manufacturing day. Uh, about two weeks ago on Long Island, it was on a Friday, a really cold, rainy day. Uh, did anyone else participate in that? So when you hear manufacturing, it doesn't have, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? People kind of look down on it sometimes on manufacturing. It's not sexy. Not sexy, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and that's generally what people think, right? And they think of sweatshops or doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, well, the truth is, uh, manufacturing, most manufacturing companies are one, under 100 people. You're doing different things every day, and the U.S. is still the leading manufacturer in the world. Only, only by 1%, but they're still the leader. And then we went and we saw several companies on Long Island, and they showed us what they're doing, and the students loved it. They, act, they really loved it. And that will lead us to this later on. Uh, I'll go over in a few minutes, but uh, it tied back to this. We got this robotic arm from a company called Pressy Parts, they're a manufacturer on Long Island. So uh, we participate in robotic competitions and really can uh, motivate the students is you have to have a good lab. We are very fortunate that we got the grant from Senator Laval. We're getting a whole bunch of high-tech equipment in. We have some, but we're getting a lot more robotic arms, laser cutters, CNC machines, linear slide bases. So it's going to be a really exciting program. So. Uh, 
So one of the things <coughs> the Project Lead the Way does is in the principles of engineering, VEX, which is a robotic platform, is part of the curriculum. So we also have a lot of VEX competitions. Uh, it's starting to grow on Long Island. Anyone ever hear of FIRST Robotics? Mm -hmm. That's the big one, right? Very expensive to join that. And it's only one team per school and one robot per school. Well, with VEX, you can have multiple teams. Jericho has five or six teams. It's a lot less expensive, yes? What age? How old? Oh, how old? Uh, can you do that? VEX, <laughs> this particular VEX, it looks like the erector set. You have it in your middle school, right? Middle school through high school. You also have VEX IQ, which is designed more for the middle school to elementary. Uh, it's plastic parts, too. And the VEX REC Foundation offers grants. I know, uh, I think Brian, you put in for one. I know Hopog put in for one. We put in for one. And we're able to get some grants to get you a robotic kit to start off in the competitions. So what we're lucky is we have Project Lead the Way, and they require VEX for the curriculum, too. So we're able to double dip. We can use it for the curriculum, and we can use it after school for the robotics competition. What's a little different than us, the students come there for half a day or a full day, morning or afternoon. We don't have clubs in the afternoon because we have no buses. The students have to go home. So it's up to them if they want to stay, or they can take a kit, work it on over the weekend, have their, their peers meet with them. And that's, Mike, that's what you do, right? <laughs> want to say anything about that? Or? Uh, well, what happens is you have to find out like, where the students live. Because some students live all the way on the <laughs> west, and some students live all the way on the east. We have some in Southampton. And you just try to collaborate. <coughs> Sometimes one of the students from Southampton would take a train down to Rakhima just so he could work on the robot. And if you try to involve as many kids as you possibly can because we all do love doing the robotics. So, and, and that's how dedicated they are. Uh, the students will come to the program. Something uh, we cover from Islip, I believe, out to Riverhead. 51 different school districts, and some students take a bus an hour each way to get to the program. Uh, and then they work together on the weekends, they stay in the evenings, uh, and we have no after school buses, so they got to get a ride home from me. Even one mother comes from Southampton every night to pick up her son. So, but they love it. Uh, and the things about the robotics, it's not just, okay, someone's got to program it. You have people have to program it, people have to design it, people have to drive it, people have to troubleshoot it. There's a whole social aspect of this game, too, because during the competition, you're paired up with other teams who you've never met before. So not every robot can do everything well. So you have to have your robot do something well, and hopefully get another robot that does the other something well. And then you have to find each other during the competition and have a, develop a partnership right there on the spot. So it, it's very unique. Uh, it involves a lot of things also like fundraising to pay for some of the stuff, scholarships, grants. We actually got a, a grant from Keith Ferry uh, to help start the program to get some more parts for our, uh, that Keith works for Eastern Suffolk BOCES. Uh, we had an internal mini grant program. Uh, we got a grant from the REC Foundation. So there's a bunch of different ways to fund the actual uh, robotics competition. And again, I'll show you how we tie it back to class too as well. Uh, this is the tournament. You can see a lot of students. Jericho. Uh, so, oh, going back to first, the big difference between first is one robot per school, generally very expensive, right? Glenn Cove, anyone from Glen Cove here? Yeah, I think you have first robotics team. Mm -hmm. I think there's 100 students on the team, right? Mm -hmm. They have teams of programmers, teams of marketing people, right? With VEX, because this is a lot less expensive, you can have multiple teams. So it's like three or four students per team. Uh, and multiple uh, teams per school. So, and it's also less expensive to participate. Uh, two years ago, there was about six or seven schools participating in the VEX competitions on Long Island. Last year, there was 67. So it's growing rapidly. Uh, we got another grant, and we had the VEX Arena. All the VEX competitions right now are hosted somewhere in Nassau County, so it's, it's a far ride for us. So we now have, we got a grant, we got the arena, and we're going to be hosting out in Bellport. So we're going to have schools from Southampton, Riverhead, hopefully Hopalong, Babylon coming, you know, instead of going into, all the way to Nassau County. So, does someone have a question? Okay. So, Mike, you want to talk about the competition rule? Yeah. 
at the VEX competitions, it's a lot more of a level playing field than first robotics because in first you can manufacture your own parts and your own metal and you can make a lot of custom things. With uh, VEX robotics, it's all VEX parts. Everyone starts at the same level and you take off from there. So you're not going to be competing against the team and lose just because they have more money to throw into these custom metal robots and all the fancy stuff. Everyone's the same. It's all based on skill, programming, and how you can build your robot. As Mike said, sometimes you look at these robots and you can tell the students did not build them. Someone's father or mother had a machine shop, right? Uh, I look again at myself as a facilitator. Here's the kit. Go look at videos. Go figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to do well in this competition. So, uh, And they did great. I know Hopog entered first year, and you also came in, right? You qualified, right? Well, yeah, qualified. <laughs> but you did well, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, students love it. Uh, these competitions are on Saturday. We will be having scrimmages after school during the week, so it's just a matter of getting transportation to the school, and it's all practice so you can qualify for the, uh, for the competitions. How and so the girls are in there? I haven't What's seen that? really any pictures of girls. They're there. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There, there. There's a whole thing about women in STEM, yeah. and uh, you know uh, what is it? The oyster? What's the saying? In your hand, you have an oyster in your palm. Something like that. scholarships, grants, everything for women in STEM. It, it's unbelievable. We don't have enough women in STEM, and there's all sorts of clubs they could join and articles on it. Like what's the ratio at the high school? Right now, we have. Uh, <laughs> Three students out of 28. So, yeah. yeah. I just to build on your statement, I'm a middle school tech teacher. If you encourage it, if you if you offer it and support it and challenge them to do it, girls will jump right on board with it because I know there are, are just as many, if not more, uh, female students that are interested in robotics and the robotics team I'm starting than. Um, Anything else? You know, it, it's all how you support it and how you build the fire. Yeah, to get minorities and females, like I said, it, the oyster. You know, they they can get whatever they want with these programs. It, it's unbelievable the grants and scholarships that are available for them. So, uh, we just had a Vanguard grant. Oh, okay, yeah, we just had a. I'm still filling out the paperwork for a female interested in STEM, and I forget how much the grant was for, but it was targeted right for females in STEM. So. How do students find out about this program? Uh, about like, like a guidance council would have to. Oh yeah, guidance counselors. Yeah. But yeah. so guidance counselors have to be aware, and I guess there has to be communication between the students' interests. And yeah, students have to. We, we do you want to talk about any of the other? Uh, for the STEM high school specifically, yeah. the uh, STEM high school uh, and the uh, is part of the CTE offerings, uh, and the way that the Eastern Suburb Boasties promotes uh, the offerings that we have at the Tech Center. Uh, we also, you know, we do um, college fairs, the, the different high schools. Uh, we're in the STEM um, news day, the STEM resource guide. Uh, there's lots of ways that we push out information to parents, um, but it really is uh, because it's a BOCES um, program, we, we generally uh, advertise through the schools. Uh, sometimes it's word of mouth. Uh, Mike joined, and then he told his friends back at school, and then they joined the school. So, all, all different ways. So, uh, so Going back to females, yeah, we want more females. You know, we encourage that all the time. Uh, this is just one of the robots, some of the awards they won. Uh, the demo. So this is what we're going to show you now. We're going to give you a little bit of an overview about Robot C and how we apply it to some of the projects and where we started versus where we are now and where we're hopefully going in the future. Uh, all different level people. Some people want to see the demo. Some people want to know the nuts and bolts about programming, and we can stick around afterwards if you have questions actually about programming. So we'll get into that. So this is this is Robot C, and this is where Mike is the subject matter expert. In this program, it's a very simple program. It just uh, it's for our test bed. So it reads values of certain sensors, and it reacts upon those values. So if it becomes too dark, it can turn a flashlight on. If you spin a knob, it can turn a motor on. If you turn a little uh, angled gear, it can set a servo to be the exact same angle. So it has practical applications, especially like the spotlight. 
if you put it outside when it gets too di too dark out later in the night, maybe a light can come on in the driveway or the lights along the side or a light in front of your front door. So the VEX is for robots, but it all has practical applications, and it's the same languages. C++ is a very common language for a lot of applications out in the real world. The prosthetic arm is all C++, so it's very similar. If you learn one, you can do basically everything else. So there's all sorts of books out there, too. Uh, Arduino is also based on C language, which we'll show you in a second. C++, which then is a derivative, you have Robot C, more, more Arduino programming. This is the test bed. This is uh, VEX components. And we have a slide, I think it's the next slide. Oh, we'll go with the brain. This is the cortex or the brain of the whole uh, setup. So Mike, you want to talk about that? Basically what this is you write your program on the computer and then you download the cortex and in each one of the cortex, you can see that they have arrows pointing to little pinholes. You plug the wires and the motors into certain pinholes. You have your analog setups, you have your digital inputs, and you have motor outputs. So depending on where you plug them in, you program that, and then you download to the cortex, and then it knows what to send, what signals to send to what ports and what signals to receive from the different sensors. So what students do is <laughs> they build the test bed right here. That's this. And this has a whole bunch of inputs and outputs on it. So Mike, maybe you want to get up and go up the screen. And this way they learn about the sensors. They learn how to program the sensors. They do it one piece at a time. And then they start putting it all together for their robots. So. So what I was what saying, the, uh, you want this, the, laser? What I was saying before is right here is the flashlight. When this light sensor goes below a certain value, then the flashlight will turn on, illuminating the test bed so you can see all the other components. Certain sensors output different types of outputs. You have digital and analog. Digital outputs are yes or no's, one or zero, on or off. So things like a button right here would be, you can see the press or it's not press. But then you have things like the light sensor and this is an ultrasonic range finder. Those output analog signals, which is a range of values. So it could be zero, maybe that means the darkest, up to 2,000 could be the brightest value. And then you just program the certain values and you test, and if it's the wrong value, you go back, you change it, you test it again, and you have to record all these changes so you know for the future, if you want to replicate it, what values to set at and what's been done and what works. So below the two gears up there, we have different types of motors. We have servo motors, we have high-speed motors, right, Mike? Yep, inside the motors, you can actually take the motors apart and change the gear ratios in them. And this is all through VEX. They provide you with the certain gear types. And you can change the motors to be high speed, to be high torque, or to just be a default motor. And they each have different applications. If you need higher torque, you can go with higher torques. The higher speed may be good for a drive, so you can go quicker. And then these servos are for your precision control. They go to set angles, and they'll always go to that angle every time. We have a counter potentiometer, right? There's a lot of different types of sensors. You have uh, potentiometers, which measures angles. You have ultrasonic range finder for distance, light sensors, a line follower, buttons. This is a little lever switch. And this one counts rotations over shaft use that for how many times the tire has spun so you can tell how far your robot has traveled. So they learn how all the different sensors work and they put it together. Uh, and then they go on to build projects. Uh, one of the projects they build in my class is a marble sort. It's supposed to simulate uh, a recycling facility. They're given four different uh, marbles, a wood and different plastic, one steel. And they have to sort through and figure out which marble goes in which container. And that goes back to here. They're using all the different sensors 
to make that robot run. So, and this is just an example of some of the code. Uh, this is one of the basic robots they start. This is a core bot. Uh, actually comes in a kit with all the parts, right? And this can actually get you going in the robot competition. Very. Right? You want to talk about that, Mike? So, like Mr. Maloney said, the claw bot comes in the kit. Uh, the kit's not that expensive, right? It's rather cheap. Yeah, the claw bot itself, right? Yeah. So, it's very easy to get started <coughs> using the claw bot. It teaches you about the motors, the certain input ports. You can hook up very easily a sensor on the arm, and then you can tell how high the arm has went. It teaches you about the gear ratios with the wheels. They're, uh, actually geared for a higher torque. So it teaches you all about the concepts and on a very simple scale, which then you could take and expand on it to make larger and different robots. If I'm not mistaken, we just built the basic claw bot to have the instructions to get us into the first VEX competition to get us going. Then they went back, they saw all the different designs and then really put the nose to the grindstone, came up with uh, oh, the one that's out outside. Uh, so all different things. This is actually over there. This is just different components you can order. So you get your basic kit. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll show that driving around, around later. I call this the crabbing. This robot can go sideways. Is, there, is that really easy to start up on? Yeah, you want to just grab it. What's unique about this, uh, the principal actually saw sort this. Of the controller labeled claw. Uh, crab, <laughs> Omni. So we got us some wheels, uh, <laughs> yeah. and we're just like anything else. We're in a rush to get into the competition, not realizing <coughs> that these wheels are in specific pairs and everything else. So we had a lot of challenges, but that's where the troubleshooting comes in, and the engineering process. So we'll see if it draws. So Mike is syncing up the uh, remote control. Very similar, so I said there's all different people required. There's drivers required for the next competition. I haven't finished the program for this. I worked on it very briefly. So right now it can go straight forward, straight back. And unlike normal vehicles, it doesn't turn. It moves perfectly sideways, linearly. So it can go I'm not sure how it's going to go on the car, but it forward like and go back. Can you make it go down the aisle? This is something that the students have to realize too. When they go into these competitions, they may be practicing on their gymnasium floor. Michael, make it go down the aisle. They're on rubber tiles, so the robot's going to perform completely different. This was actually built and tested on a hardwood floor. That's why on the carpet right now, the wheel is actually getting stuck on the carpet, so it's not moving how it should be. So that's one of the things you would have to account for where you build it and then where you use it. I, I call it crabbing because it's like a crab and it's funny watching it go sideways. So, <laughs> but this allows for a lot more mobility in the robotics competition. So uh, that's just one of the different robots. So we talked about earlier, we talked about the Cortex, right? Uh, this kit, the complete VEX project kit is probably around a thousand dollars that you would get from the REC Foundation. Uh, some schools may not be able to afford that. Uh, there's another programming device called the Arduino. Arduino basically is a programmable chip that has a lot of inputs and outputs on it. And it runs on uh, C++ as well. So once they know how to program, they can then start transferring it to different things. So Mike, you want to talk about the Arduino a little? So the Arduino is very similar to the Cortex in that it has your digital ports with the ones and zeros. It has analog ports up top, so you can have your range values. And it also has preset grounds, power, and a reset, and other functions up at the top that you can program to do different things, very similar to the robot. You could program a VEX robot from the Arduino. I think somebody was saying, who was saying they did it with the Qualcomm phone? That's uh, FTC is actually using Qualcomm phones. Qualcomm. They use the phone to yeah. program their robot. So uh, th this is USB based, you plug it into your computer, uh, you do your C++ coding, so in uh, Arduino software, 
It's basically uh, free industry software. This is 50 to $75 for this setup. Uh, the one we have here, what was the box here? Oh, it's underneath. It's a little more expensive. Uh, this was $95. Same thing, it's got the Arduino, but it's got a couple sensors and uh, switches in it. Mike, you want to show them that, what you did? So what can you do with the Arduino? So, this is where we started with the Arduino. So right here on the table. That's your Arduino right over there. And Mike had already programmed it. And we had a couple sensors. Oh, is the power off on it? Yeah, it's not. The USB go to sleep on it? There we go. Okay. On the table, a very simple application. I'm going to shut the lights for a second, see if it makes it any better. There it is. Is I took the accelerometer that came Mike, can you hold that under the, uh, the webcam? Yeah. The accelerometer is actually right underneath this black foam square. I have protected so it doesn't get damaged. But it measures different types of tilt. So with this, it's a very simple application. You just move the light to one of the lights, and then it changes where it is. Very simple, but you can use this to go further and maybe make a little game out of it, or for a more practical application. If anyone has like a camper they use, a mobile camper, when you park it somewhere, if it's unlevel, maybe this can tell how unlevel it is, and the legs can automatically move and adjust its level back to the center. That could be a very useful application. I believe they do actually have that on some of the newer campers. One of these sensors that comes in the kit is a uh, motion sensor. This would be like if you have a light near your driveway that when you walk by it, it turns on. That's what this sensor does. And you can program this straight through the Arduino. It came with the Arduino package. Very simple with the C++. There's one more. Yeah. Oh, the joystick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. basic joystick. You find these on many gaming controllers. And with the Arduino, you can program the joystick to, whenever it moves in a certain direction, maybe move a robot, move a light, do something. So that can get you into, if you're into game design, you can work with maybe two joysticks and maybe make a little uh, side scroller game. And it's very simple to do, so almost anyone can do it. It's very easy to learn and it's very quick to expand on. So we had this presentation coming up and I said, Mike, you know, we, we had the VEX kits, <laughs> a little bit pricey. We had the Arduino, what can we do with the Arduino? And, and they actually came up with this idea with the, we had the LEDs from our digital electronics. We had the breadboard, but even the breadboard is only like $10, the LEDs are a few dollars. So we had the Arduino, Mike had his programming expertise, but still, what are we gonna do? And that's when they came up with this idea putting these LEDs and finding a level. So it's it's their ideas. Again, I view myself as a facilitator, and they come up with a creative idea. So we went to, from that, uh, let's jump back, Mike. Any questions on the Arduino yet? Yes. Just quick, the, the, the interface is a, the programming, it's a software, it's what right, can you show, pull that up? So this is called a sketch, and this okay. comes with the Arduino software. Is it it's something you install on a computer, or it's web yeah. based? It's app app based. Ah, uh, this is installed on the computer. Free to download and very simple to use. Same setup as many other uh, programming <coughs> programs. You can compile your program, verify it, make sure it works, and you just upload it to their Arduino you know, straight from here. How how close is that programming language to Robot C? It's it similar? very similar. Plus plus based, so there's a few things that the robot C does specific to VEX robotics right. that the Arduino can't do because it's just not made like that. But all your basic functions, all the syntax, everything's very simple. So it's 
pretty fluid as far as a natural progression from programming yeah. from the breakout board to, mm -hmm. to a and lot. Th there's now there's all sorts of Arduino clones out there, Arduinos uh, based out of Italy, and there's all sorts of Arduino clones that are even less money. And you have things like Raspberry Pi, which I'm not familiar with, but I've heard about. It. And I said, it, the goal is to get the students interested in programming, because uh, I know a couple of robotics teams in here, the biggest challenge I have, the students always want to drive the robot, mm -hmm. they always want to build the robot. All right, who wants to program the robot? And it's getting better, but that's always the challenge. So, uh, uh, that's the example Mike just told, told you about. Again, it was their idea. Uh, we then took a 9-volt battery, we were able to use the power to power the lights. Uh, this is just an example of a fab lab. This is where we're going. We're going to have robotic arms, things like that. So why coding? Coding is almost in every single device. Uh, it's even in your refrigerator now. They have smart refrigerators. You put a container of milk in, you take it out, <laughs> put it back in, and you take it out. And they're going to have tags on the milk container saying, why didn't you put the milk container back in? Well, it's old or out of milk and then it's going to radio over to your, your supermarket have a container of milk ready for you when you go in there all right and they can even have peapod deliver you that container of milk because you never put it back in the refrigerator so that's that's where it's going yeah yeah, yeah. and so all the kids every kid has a cell phone they're attached to it uh, they're going to be creating their own apps on cell phones and one of the apps that i saw the other day uh, a lot of educators in here, school open house is always crazy, right? People are always lost. A student wrote an app for a cell phone, you punch in what room you have and had a map to take you to the room. So, so coding is going to be all over the place. Gaming is another, it's huge gaming, right? So uh, this is the history. Uh, I know you said you did basic, right? I did basic I did and business basic. I was in college, right? And it's just, it's constantly evolving. Uh, C++ and you have Robot C. Python, Scratch, uh, this is more machine code, which we're going to be getting into later this year. So the coding keeps evolving. Hopefully some of these look familiar to you. Uh, coding products, we already started talking about the VEX, the first robotics, the Arduino. So, so how did we get, oh, this is, Mike, is this place? So I, I talked about gaming. Gaming is based a lot on programming. I was at RIT over the summer. And Governor Cuomo was up there. He got a <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were not even. We were in this one section of the building, and he was up there. We were not even allowed in that section anyway. Oh. Quartered it all off. Of course not. But he was awarding them a seventeen million dollar grant for their. Uh, it's called the Magic Center. Media, arts, gaming, interactivity. What's the last one? Should show you right over there. Creativity, creativity. So they just got 17 million, and it's supposedly a renewable grant. I actually have a student who went up to the Magic Center. He loved it. So uh, they, so, and this is where all these pieces of the puzzle started coming together. Really, just a coincidence, but it worked out. So at the Magic Center, they developed a product called uh, uh, Enable. So this is a, a prosthetic hand printed on a 3D printer. It's, it's not a true prosthetic. This is a prosthetic hand that's meant for someone that has a hand, but maybe the grip doesn't work. So this is a small version. You put your hand in here, and as you, you're able to flex your grip, it's able to close, and now you're able to grip things. So this was developed at the Magic Center. Coincidence. Someone left this in my mailbox, Half Hollow Hills, who is that Half Hollow Hills? Half Hollow Hills just had this at their library, uh, lending a hand. And it's about schools and other companies helping print these 3D parts and hooking them up with a, donate, a donor, you know, a donee, so you can donate these parts to for people who uh, require some type of uh, uh, product, prosthetic product. Well. I had a friend who had a prosthetic, uh, has a prosthetic business, and he started showing me some of his prosthetics. And this is one of them. You put the strap around you, you flex, and it opens. We did just it opens the hand right here, and you control the strength by the rubber band. So I had this, I saw this, and then I mentioned the other day we were at manufacturing day pressing parts, 
And I'm walking through pressy parts, and lo and behold, is this arm printed on a Maker, uh, Maker Pot 3D printer. So I was looking at it, and the owner of the company said, yeah, we want to participate in this enable thing to help people with prosthetic arms. So they took it to another level. They put all these servo motors in here, right here. Just out of that, right? oh. So they, have, they put all these motors, this is the one we developed, uh, we didn't develop, we printed all these files are available for anyone to download and print. So my goal for the students is to take something like this, they had to put it, print it, put it together, hopefully in the future modify it, make it more user friendly, add some more features to it. But Pressy Park took it, they put some motors, these are all hooked up to fishing lines, right? So I see it, I was like, wow, well, you know, we're doing something similar, but not this high level. He said, well, we can do this, but we don't know how to program it. So the, this is the Arduino here hooked up. This is just a power supply hooked up to this, and it might program it, it might do a letter rip. tripod, it does something called a power grip, which could be um, maybe holding a suitcase, you have to hold it pretty tight. And then they have gentler grips, so if you're holding a cup of coffee in a styrofoam cup, you don't squeeze the cup and break it. <laughs> it can, if you have a hand that's built very well and you can program it, you can have it so they can hold a mouse and actually click the buttons of the mouse so they can use computers with both hands again. You can use the point finger I've seen to type on keyboards. So you have your one hand and then the other hand can help type. So you try to make it so it's not a, uh, what's the word, hindrance? Hindrance, yeah. So, so it's very easy. Yeah, this, this is very similar to a, a, a real uh, prosthetic hand. The motors are sh shrank down and of course they don't have a cord. They use lithium ion batteries and my friend was showing me who had it. Those are at least $25,000. And then Turk told me about this website, Be Bionic, and that's when it started telling me about all the different grips. And that's when Mike started programming all the different grips for the hand. So uh, in, a, in a real life situation, these motors will be shrank down. You have a lithium ion battery, USB plug, you plug it in all the time. And your arm would send pulses called Mio Electric to the mo servo motors and it would open and close the hand and do whatever you need and you would train your body for that. So uh, very similar to a real life situation, uh, except this was you know, $100 worth of plastic and $50 worth of servo motors. So it's able to benefit a lot of people in the world, hopefully, and it gives them a direction of where I can do this. And this is all back from this $50 hard to and, and just like I said, I, good timing when I happened to be a manufacturer today and I saw the arm. Uh, they have other things too now where I mentioned your refrigerator is a smart refrigerator. They're going to have tags on the refrigerator and all the items. They can do it with these hands too. Like say if your arm does not, is not able to send those electrical pulses. So they can have tags. You put a tag on your coffee cup and a tag on your hand. So when you get close to your hand, it knows what grip to do so you can grip the coffee cup. You have a tag in your pocket. So you're going to put your hand in your pocket. It's normally open. You put it close to your pocket. It closes so you can put your hand right in the pocket. So these are all different technologies that are coming out. And they're getting exposed to it. And then it's really up to them and their creativity. You know, last night we had the arm. We were on the table. Like, yeah, that's nice. What can we do? They whipped together this thing. And then they mounted it on the stand. They might get a little programming the thumbs up. So, what are they going to do in the future? 
you know, who knows? It's it's literally unlimited. <coughs> they have creativity. How much time do they want to put? Oh, helpful websites. Let's just hit this like. Uh, shift down to the Cortex video, the second one. So if you have students who are new to programming. This tells you how to program Robot C. Alright, it's got all the different tabs in there. So we're we'll getting close to time, so we'll skip out of that mic, right? Uh, this should be another interesting one. Might have to just close that mic. There you go. The REC Foundation. This is where some grants are available. And this also tells you where the robotic competitions are. So there's grants, challenges. Uh, middle school, young and younger students, high school students. All right. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting website, Chris and Jim. Who are Chris and Jim? Chris and Jim are two teachers who love robotics. They put together a whole robotics website. And you can go there and they have all different things. They have blogs, you can contact them directly, like pointers, tips. This is not working, how do I get it to work? So I, I communicate with them regularly. Talks about the cortex, everything else. Primarily VEX based, but you can see the VEX will tie to Arduino, will tie to Raspberry Pi, and, and all these other different products out there, and all the clone products too. So that's what we have. Does anyone have any questions? Or? I just want to also add that uh, in uh, Long Island today we had a, a, a keynote it was from Coder Dojo, New York City, but there's also Coder Dojo on Long Island. Um, they also run the Kid OYO, uh, which is stands for Kid on Your Own, OYO. Um, they are trying to push into schools and to help um, provide coding lessons for traditional ELA, math, um, regular units that your teachers are, are creating and building a coding unit on the end to so you can bring coding projects into ELA fifth grade or seventh grade. Or, so I would recommend highly that if your, your district is interested in connecting with um, coding, with how do you push in, um, these programs do what exists currently. Um, Kid Oyo, and, and they're the same people who run Coder Dojo, right? Kid Oyo and Coder Dojo are the same people on Long Island. Um, can absolutely help. And so if you're interested in learning more about our program, you can always come to our facility after school. Uh, you can always contact me to check out some of the technology we have or we'll participate in the scrimmages. It's pretty much an open door. I'm uh, a member of the Long Island Technology Education Association. We meet regularly. I know a few people here are members of it. Uh, we exchange ideas, thoughts. We tell each other what we're doing, how can we promote the program, promote STEM, promote engineering. So. Again, I'm Ed Maloney, this is Mike Panic. <laughs>